Hi, welcome to Let's Talk Folks with Alison and Chris. So this week, we've got a really exciting episode lined up. We're talking to Caroline Rundell, aka Trading Angel on YouTube. She's a professional trader and a trading coach, and her own trading journey from beginner to professional is a really inspiring one. And she has some really excellent trading tips too. So please enjoy the episode. And if you have any questions, send them through to us at podcast at fxscouts.com or reach out to us on any of our social media channels. Hey, Chris, how's it going? Hey, Alison. Yeah, I'm okay, thanks. How are you? Yeah, very good. I'm very excited about our podcast today. Mm, Yes, as Um, am I. (laughs) So we are very excited to introduce Caroline Rundell. I hope that's how I say your surname, Caroline. That is how you say it, Caroline Rundell. Rundell. Rundell, okay. Um, Caroline um, has a YouTube channel and she is a trading coach and her channel is called Trading Angel, or her company is called Trading Angel, um, and she's a successful Forex trader, and she helps traders start on their Forex trading journeys and helps them refine their strategies. And yeah, we just, uh, she has a very inspiring story, so I think, I think you guys are, you know, in for a real treat today. So Caroline, you were born in Durban, South Africa, and uh, so can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, I was born in Durban. Uh, My dad is actually South African. My Mm. mum is Scottish. (laughs) Um, So they met in South Africa. And we moved to England when I was three. So I didn't get much time in South Africa. But um, yeah, and then I moved to Holland when I was six. So I lived in three different countries by the time I was six years old. (laughs) But as my accent's English, if anyone asks, I just tell them I'm English. (laughs) Absolutely. And have have you been back to South Africa since? Um, I went back a couple times when I was a child, and I actually went back for the first time as an adult last year. Or was it the year before? 2022, I went back. Wow. Where did you go? I went along. So we went for a safari in, where was it? It was just, it was about an hour away from Port Elizabeth, a place called Carriega. Oh, and wow. we then went to Plessenberg Bay. Beautiful. And to Cape Town, and yeah, I just went to a few different places. And did it uh, sort of did it resonate with you as, as sort of part of your roots? It was a crazy experience because when <laughs> I first, <laughs> honestly, when I first got there, I felt like I was in a foreign country. I felt very much like I it wasn't my home. Yeah. And then by the end of the holiday, I'd seen so many little things that I had remembered as a child from my first memories. That by the end, I really felt like it was my home. It's a really strange wow. feeling. But lots of little things wow. that I don't remember remembering that came back to me. Wow, that's a really it's powerful so experience. Weird. Yeah, mm. it was um, Yeah, it was a lot deeper than I thought it was going to be. I thought I was just going on safari. <laughs> 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 but I mean, that, that part of the country also is just it's spectacular. Hey? From, from Plitz yeah. to Cape Town is just absolutely beautiful. It's oh, a really funny. beautiful country. And everyone's so friendly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's is a fr- I mean I don't I don't know because <laughs> <I love it. laughs> but it does, you know, we often get that sort of feedback. I was actually just um and and when did, so you moved when you were 3 and then when did you actually end up in Brighton? You were just we were just chatting oh. earlier and you you said that you've been there for 10 years now. Yeah, so there was a lot in between that, but <laughs> um, I moved to Brighton in 2014, so it's been almost exactly 10 years now. And and before um, before you got into forex trading, you were you were a journalist, is that correct? Yeah, so I my background isn't in finance. My background is in journalism. So I worked as a radio journalist. So I'd read the news bulletins at the local radio station here in Brighton. Right. Yeah, and. Uh, and then I moved into finance. <laughs> <laughs> how, did, how, did that, how did that happen? I mean, I'm just wondering. So you're reading a news bulletin, and, and yeah, was it was it, um, was it from reading the financial news? I mean, how did the interest? Where did the interest come from? 
Um, there was a couple places. So first of all, it first of all, I was poor. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, so, often <laughs> often one of the largest motivators for forex trading. <laughs> yeah, I'd spent a lot of money um, studying and I guess trying to start up my career in journalism. It I put a lot on credit cards when I was um, being an intern and doing apprenticeships. Uh, there was a lot of working for free, so I was then in this situation where I felt poor. And one of my friends, one of my really good friends, worked as a forex broker in London. So he was obviously at ICAP, so a big, um, a big exchange. And yep. he was always the rich friend that bailed everyone else out. So <laughs> <laughs> everybody needs one, right? <laughs> everyone needs a rich friend, yeah. So I, I suppose I was inspired by that, and I would hear him talking about certain things and I guess I felt like I knew enough <laughs> from hearing him talk now I realize that that's ridiculous and I knew nothing <laughs> at all but that was what kick-started the journey that's what kick-started the interest right and then was it a genuine interest or is it or is it or is it like a oh my gosh, I, re I need money and this sounds like something I can do? Or is it, was it something that, that <laughs> sucked question. you in? Or is it something that sucked you in? Really good question. Um, honestly, it, it started off about the money yeah. and it became a genuine interest. Mm -hmm. So now I will talk about it passionately mm -hmm. and I really am very interested. But I, when I first started, you know what? I wasn't good with money. Um, mm -hmm. I, as I say, I was putting things on credit cards and I was interning mm -hmm. for free. I was making a lot of stupid decisions around money. And I, I suppose I was scared to face it head on because I think often people do get like that. You know, when they feel yeah. like they're not good at something, they're afraid to actually face it and mm -hmm. put it right. I was the sort of person I wouldn't even check my bank account because I was too afraid. Of what I mean, I no, no, incredibly common. It really is a common yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, so that was that was me ten years ago, mm -hmm. um, and I think I realised. Yeah, it became a genuine. It became a genuine, um, a genuine passion, and it became more about the learning side of it. And now I pride myself on being good at money. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, <laughs> a, a handy side circle. effect. <laughs> A handy, a, a handy side effect of becoming a handy side effect of becoming a handy trade. side effect. Yeah. yeah, I think I thought that that was you know. That was a likely outcome, wasn't it? If you start learning about something, you know, where where attention goes, energy flows and all, whatever that one is. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So I thought that let's uh, let's turn over a new leaf. Let's be good at finance. <laughs> and you've um, you mentioned, I mean, I was on, on your videos that you had a cup that, you know, your first forays into trading were a bit rocky um uh, yeah at first i mean <laughs> and i think i think probably a lot of beginners will identify with that uh how exactly did you start i mean where did you start and uh, where did um, you start trading <laughs> oh my goodness i was awful at the beginning <laughs> 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 it's so bad i'll tell you i'll tell you some funny stories about how awful i was right so <laughs> first of all i spoke to my friend the one that was the broker and i called him up before i placed my first trade uh, for some advice so you know any advice I'm about to do I'm going to do I'm going to place my first trade what's what advice do you have and he said <laughs> he said don't risk more than five percent which actually turns out is a lot <laughs> mm -hmm. probably shouldn't have said that um and I, I, thought, said, I thought you were going to say Caroline I thought you were going to say he was going to say don't do it <laughs> <No>. <laughs> 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 do you know what he did say he said he said trading isn't easy so go slow and I was like, yeah, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Don't worry. <laughs> right. Just dived in head first. Um, I thought as well, I thought that I needed to make my first trade with pounds. I needed to sell pounds because I thought I've only got pounds. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so, I, so I was asking him these weird questions, which didn't even make any sense. So I was like, so if I want yen, do I have to then sell pounds and buy US dollars? And then, buy, you know, do I have to do this? <laughs> no, you can trade whatever you like. <laughs> Gosh, amazing. So really completely uh, yeah. with no understanding, very in, yeah. Uh, yeah, innocent. Yeah, and I placed my first trade with that little knowledge. <laughs> and how did that go? I lost two pounds. <laughs> yep. I mean, fair enough. Well, it could have been worse. <laughs> it could have been a lot worse. So did you like, but did you study anything? I mean, did you like trade on a demo account? Did you do any of that, that groundwork or did you literally 
like place a trade <laughs> once you realize I did a, t- a tiny bit of groundwork. I I what? wouldn't say that I did. I wouldn't say that I did enough. Um, I'm really lucky that it didn't go worse. <laughs> um, I did a bit of reading. I read a book, a book, a beginner's book. I had a, a few conversations with my friend about it and certain things. And I spent one day on demo. One day. Which I do not recommend to other people. <laughs> I was obviously overconfident. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, but yeah, I mean, I imagine you lost that confidence fairly quickly. Uh, oh my when, goodness. Yeah. There were some devastating moments. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to drag you back to the devastation, but uh, <laughs> did you find that, did you find the devastating moments useful in terms of motivation or learning or did they make you want to quit? Um, You know what? There's a nice combination of the two. So there were times when I thought, you know what, this is impossible. Um, mm-hmm. What am I doing? This is clearly impossible. And then I would say that my biggest losses came, helped me make my biggest wins in the end. So my biggest losses made me realize that there was a massive gap in my knowledge with fundamentals Mm -hmm. because I put in a lot of time and effort to understand technicals and any time I would make a devastating loss, it was always my lack of knowledge on fundamentals. Right. So that took me down the path of then actually, you know, paying institutional traders to help me um and you know really brushing up on that side of things and now my biggest wins come from news days and making the most Mm -hmm. of the volatility that comes on those so in a nice way it worked out yeah i was gonna say yeah nice yeah nice balance there but also it's it's quite amazing that you realized where the mistakes were and what your downfalls were and that you then sought to rectify that you know um, I'd say I had I'd say I had quite a few devastating losses before I realized. <laughs> <laughs> like what what is the common denominator by all these giant losses? <laughs> and eventually I got there. But were you um, I mean you're still making these giant losses, but I assume you were keeping your head above water with some wins at the same time. Yeah, and I think that's what kept me motivated. I mm. think for a long time my technical analysis was very good, but technical analysis means absolutely nothing when there's a news event that comes out. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, so I think that's what was happening. I was making consistent wins and then I would lose on the news days. Mm-hmm. So I thought right. about not trading the news days, but then I thought, how, hang on a minute. What if I learned how to trade them? <laughs> Absolutely. Good. And it's something that we advise, um, people as well. Like if you're a raw beginner, like really don't, don't trade on news days, yeah. stay away from them. So you realize this, but then you, you kept on trading on news days for a while by the sound of things. And when did you, at what point did you say, okay, I need to understand this? I mean, how many, how long was it into your, into your trading that you realized I need to, I need to get a mentor here. I need to get on top of this. Shamefully long. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I can understand that. And then, <laughs> I mean, it's about facing your, facing, you know, the worst side of it, right? Or facing what's yeah. bad and actually get doing something about it. It's really tricky. And, you know, we were speaking before and I, I came from the other way, you know, and I, I, understood economics and the fundamentals and found technical analysis a pretty bizarre world when I first encountered it mm. and 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 also bounced off it I didn't really want didn't really want to have to didn't I had the arrogance or the overconfidence you know <laughs> of assuming assuming that I didn't want to um I didn't need I didn't need technical analysis mm. how you know what yeah and so I understand that very very much but then I mean you said you did get a mentor um yeah. How, how did that happen? How did you go about doing that? And um, how beneficial was it for you? Uh, well, life-changing. <laughs> life-changing. Um, I got a mentor. It was a guy called Patrick Reed, who I actually worked with on, um, we did a an event together, like a trading event which I was hosting. And we just stayed in contact after that. And I signed up to his program. And it was for three months we did we went over the news events of that day so in the morning he would do this um like a live room in a sense with everyone that signed up and he would go over all of the macro economics for the day and what they were looking for and you know how to trade certain situations and that made such a big difference to everything it all started to click into place and it just made me realize that you know, how much you had to take each day on its individuality. You can't trade 
I mean, you, the same things happen at the same time every day. You know, you get the London Open, you get the New York mm-hmm. Open, you get all these, the same things happen, but also you get different things that happen each day and you have to take each day on its individuality. Mm-hmm. It's amazing as well. I mean, there's so many moving parts in the fundamentals, you mm-hmm. know, like, and how things influence each other. And then you've got the correlated assets. So it's quite a thing to learn to know then how everything's going to, you know, what what's going to affect you. And I'm assuming, were you trading currencies at that point? Yeah, yeah. The the um, I was trading Forex at the time, yeah. I've only recently, well, recently, in the last two years, I've moved on to indices more. But yeah, at the time okay. it was Forex. And were you, by this point, I mean, in your, in your journey, were you, were you, I, you picked up some understanding of economics and fundamentals, I guess, through your trading, did you find it? Did you find it difficult to pick it up the fundamentals, or is it was it a fairly fairly easy learning process for you? Mm, interesting question, actually, because um, I think I remember it differently to how I think I think I started off finding it difficult. I remember feeling a little bit lost at the beginning. I used to call them clever class. So I'd say I'm off to clever class. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't really understand what they're talking about, but I think if I just keep turning up, eventually I'll get it. Um and then by the end of it, I felt like I was an expert in it. So mm-hmm. um it started off, yeah, it started off, I felt like they were talking different language. I had no idea what was going on. But I just kept asking questions and kept showing up. And and I think when you actually, and this is one of the great things about coaching and teaching other people, is when you start to retell information that you've learned it sinks in for you a lot easier Mm -hmm. so yeah I think it started off difficult and then I ended up picking it up but I also think that there's I think it can be taught very easily I don't think it needs to be that complicated so yeah I I think there's a very easy way to explain it to people well it sounds like you you are very good at doing that then because you probably you know I think because you've gone through that process you understand what people don't understand and what seems so foreign and then you've probably developed a very uh yeah I, I, I don't want to use the word easy but an easy way <laughs> for them to understand it as well because you've been through the process yourself yeah i try my hardest to make everything as easy to understand as possible because there are whilst there are people who come to me from a finance background and they tend to pick up things very very quickly and easily um there is also a lot of people who you know or have no finance background and don't understand any of the lingo or um, the jargon and you have to make I mean I always think and it's similar to journalism actually where you have to try and tell a story like you're talking to a 12 year old so <laughs> I try <laughs> because you know you have to try and make it accessible to everyone so mm. yeah I do try my hardest to make difficult or complicated subjects as easy to understand as possible and I try and think of it like talking to a child <laughs> <laughs> very good how would you yeah. explain and, this to a child <laughs> so you went through this uh, mentoring program and you came out the other side um with a, it sounds like a solid grasp of the fundamentals and was this was this point that you transitioned from a part-time trader to a professional well to a full-time or or started or had you already quit your um, your day job at this point no. So what actually happened was there was this pandemic. <laughs> it was. You remember that? <laughs> I remember it, yeah. yeah. It was about four, almost exactly four years ago now. Yeah. Um, that kind of kick-started a bit of it because I had a set, I'd set up Trading Angel in 2019 and that was some unbelievably fortunate piece of luck that I'd done that just before it all kicked mm. off. Um, and then when we all got sent into lockdown and everyone was, you know, working less, I had already set up this business. I'd already set up Instagram pages. I'd already kickstarted everything. So that helped a soft, make it a soft launch. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Gosh, that is amazing, isn't it? And at that point, I think, Caroline, so many people started getting into trading hey? yeah. since they were locked oh, down. Yeah. So they were like, how do I make money online? <laughs> yeah. And also the rise of Zoom. <laughs> mm-hmm. oh, no, that yeah. became a big thing. Zoom meetings, um, it all suddenly took off. I think it was something people maybe felt a tiny bit uncomfortable with before. Everyone liked to do things face to face, but then, you know, it became a lot more, yeah, acceptable to do everything on Zoom. <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that is really providential. So, mm-hmm. so you set up so you set up Trading Angel, and then the pandemic hit, and I assume you were furloughed along with the rest of us. No, because you weren't. Was, no, because I was a freelancer, and we slipped oh, through the gosh. net. Oh, yes, through the net. Yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, all right. It turned out okay. I'm all right. <laughs> yeah, no, it Five. turned out. It turned out okay in the yeah. end. Yeah, I have. I, you know, I've got. I've got support, and uh, everything was okay. And mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I was. I suppose I was lucky in that sense. I'd already set up this business, so I'd already kick started the process. Mm-hmm. And actually, I was able to still work as a journalist because we were. What was it on the exempt list? And I actually. Mm-hmm. I got to drive into London whilst no one else was allowed to go out. It was a completely wild situation because I'd drive into London, <laughs> no cars on the road. I would get to park for free in central London. And then I got to report on this huge event. Um, and it was nice to be able to get out of the house as well. So I, I was still doing a couple of days a week doing that. So, yeah, it wasn't um, – yeah, it it worked out okay. It was okay. It was a soft launch, let's say. A <laughs> soft launch. Time. Yeah. <laughs> and then, have, and I, as Alison said, I mean, as we all know, like, I mean, trading in all forms, right, really exploded over the course of the pandemic. Did you see, I mean, I assume this, you saw Trading Angel really pick up steam uh, during the pandemic? Um, I suppose it was only starting out, so it's difficult to know. Mm-hmm. If I mean, I think, yeah, it's difficult to know, I suppose, because it was only starting out anyway, so I didn't really have much prior experience to that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, I, I don't know, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> right. It could have it could have been because of that, but I know that a lot of people were interested in it. Um, the problem was as well that there was the rise in scams mm. and that made it seem a little bit dodgy in a way and mm-hmm. I had to fight my corner that I was genuine yeah um, it's something we we uh, talk and write a lot about and warn mm. people about a lot um yeah there's a huge I mean in the UK I mean it's uh, UK is is relatively good actually but um in South Africa and in some of the places where we work um in Malaysia and in Brazil for instance I mean the the amount of trading scams are just it's unbelievable uh, yeah. these days and we we keep um we keep a record people get in touch with us who've been scammed and it's just uh an absolute uh, yeah it's incredible what uh what people are getting away with these days mm-hmm. i find it's the confluence um unholy confluence of social media and and um crypto payments um allows yeah. a lot of scammers to get away with uh, a lot of things so when you said you had to fight your corner i mean what were you up against well i mean one thing obviously is that my pictures get taken and people make right. copycat sites oh, no. uh, so, sorry copycat sites um pretending to be me so i had people coming to me saying that and i still get this to be honest i still get people coming to me saying that they got scammed or like where's my money and mm-hmm. i said well i don't take investments so i've never taken your money and then they say well, you know they show me the site and it was someone who taken my pictures um Gosh. And it's very difficult because they they feel angry at me because they feel like they gave me money, but they didn't. (laughs) And it's very difficult for me to do anything about that other than to refer them to, you know, the um, yeah. Yeah. So Mm. um, that was I mean, that was another reason, obviously, why I wanted to go into to take the qualifications, because Mm. I wanted to have some kind of, I guess, formal recognition in in Mm. a world that had so many. I don't know. I guess, um, yeah, I guess scammers is, is the one thing mm-hmm. as well. But also, I guess unqualified. There's a lot of people that are also unqualified. So, yeah, that's yeah. what led me down that path. It's such a diff- – and it's such a heartbreaking – I mean, you must also have these – you know, you must also feel so sorry for these people. But as you say, I mean, there's just mm-hmm. not much you can do about it, you know. I mean, when I read some of these stories, it's absolutely heartbreaking. It makes me quite emotional. I just, you know, I just feel so yeah. sad for all these people. It's people who are already yeah. vulnerable. It's people who are already scared because you're not exactly. going to, yeah. And that's yeah. they they prey on that. So yeah, it's horrible. It's also quite difficult as well because um, I started to become aware that the scammers themselves were pretending to be victims mm-hmm. as a way to scam me. <laughs> right. 
So they would say to me, so they would then try and blackmail me and say, oh, you've scanned me, you're responsible for this. And it occurred to me that actually I think these were the people, these were actually scammers rather than victims, but they were pretending to be victims. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've got no evidence of that. It's just it felt that way because things like they said, oh, you've taken a lot of money off me. I'd say, how much? And they would say, oh, I don't know, you know, like a lot. I'd say, well, if you've got scammed, <laughs> you would know that you would know the exact amount to a penny. But also, um, I mean, that's a, a scam I come across quite a lot. Is we they actually they write on our sites all the time. Hey, Chris. Yeah, we get a lot of them. If you have been scammed by this broker, and firstly, it's it's like a very well regulated broker, so I already have a red flag as soon as I see that. Contact mm. me. I will get. I was also scammed. I'll get your money back for you. Um, um, and. It's quite a common, uh, you know, it's just a common scam that are, that we often come across. Yeah, there's a story of that lady who got met somebody, uh, got scammed on Instagram, lost a bunch of money, went onto Facebook and was complaining about this, met somebody who said they'd get their money back and then got scammed by them. Oh, goodness. Took away more oh. money. Yeah, I know. It's it's outrageous. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I can't imagine. But, uh, you, but you seem so, um, but you said you fought your corner and you offended them off, and, but they're still coming. Oh, they're still, yeah, they're still there. I mean, I've actually made my, you know, one of my Instagrams, my personal Instagram private now, because mm-hmm. it was just getting too much, all the people going through my contacts and um, so my followers and asking them all for money. Oh, and it was God. all my friends. And so, you know, my friends, my family, people who actually know me, mm. are, it's really mm. embarrassing. <laughs> Because they'll be messaging me and go, are you all right? Do you need money? Yeah, and this is, I mean, this is something we've talked about before on this podcast as well is, I mean, the reputational problem that trading has, you know, mm. and it's a lot of these guys and, and girls out there, you know, who who do this, these scams, and it, it really drags the whole industry through the mud. Yeah, and, absolutely. Um, it gives it such a bad name when it really doesn't deserve it once you once you get past it. Yeah, yeah. And there's so many people out there who are genuinely trying to help, but mm. it's difficult to it's difficult to distinguish. It is. It is. Do you find any stigma attached to your to your chosen profession now? Yeah. <laughs> you do. Yeah. I think I mean for a long time people wouldn't take it seriously. So mm. I used to get people belittling it and I would always get, Are you still doing that that trading thing? I'd be like, What, my job? <laughs> that trading thing, my job. <laughs> yeah yeah so i think and then i would get also people they would ask isn't is it not just all a big scam and Mm. say you know there are obviously there are scammers but the whole thing obviously isn't a scam i mean it's a high risk Mm. form of investing ultimately isn't it so It it does need to be approached with caution and there are there is evidence to suggest a lot of people don't succeed in it Mm. but no, obviously it's not a scam. <laughs> no. As I tell people, you know, there's a reason why the biggest investment banks in the world do this, you know, yeah. in huge amounts of money. They do it because it makes money. They're not doing mm. it for fun. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if, if we just yeah, get back to your personal journey, um, mm. can you tell us a little bit about your your trading style? Like, yeah. I don't know, if, you know, are you a day trader? Do you find yourself scalping more? Or um, do you, you know, so do you, do you hold positions sort of overnight or do you hold longer term positions? Well, okay. So my, um, my trading styles changed in the last couple of years. So in the last two years, I've developed a new strategy, um, which is looking at the indices and it's, I would say it's day trading. Um, but sometimes it ends up being scalping on a really good day when you know there's so much volatility it just hits you take profit but obviously that doesn't happen that doesn't happen every day that it goes that quickly but yeah on the whole it's day trading I don't like to hold trades overnight because I really value my sleep (laughs) and (laughs) best way to lose sleep is to hold a trade overnight um and yeah it, it kind of defeats holding it overnight kind of defeats I guess, the strategy in itself and the plan, because I'm really looking for those big momentum moves at those key times of day. So I like to, I like to get in and out within the session. So I'm looking okay. for the UK 100. There's usually, there's usually around one momentum move in the London session. And that's what I'm looking for on that. And then for New York, I then look on the US 30 and the NASDAQ. 
And usually you can get two in New York session if you're patient. Okay. So I'm looking for those. There's usually one either on or around the open or a news event if there is a news event. And then there's usually a period of consolidation and a second momentum move towards the end of the day. So okay. it's a long day. <laughs> it is a long day, yeah. yeah. What, what, are your, what are your trading hours? Uh, I mean, obviously you, you're you doing the UK Open and then the New York. So you've, you know, there's sort of, what, six hours between the two Opens and then you're trading at the end of the New York session as well. Yeah, so, I mean, overall it's a long day, but there are, you know, the uh, London Opens for me in the UK at eight o'clock. Um, mm-hmm. Occasionally there'll be a news release at seven, like the inflation news is worth getting up early for. Um, because that usually has a big move at seven. Um, but other than that, yeah, it's um, it's looking for that momentum move. Sometimes it happens straight away. If there's a lot of momentum, um, then it will it will happen straight away, which is obviously the best case scenario because <laughs> then you yeah. can be in and out and you've uh, in and out of that session and you can have a bit of a break. Um, the late morning tends to be the best time for me to go to the gym or – to do anything else, any of my errands or any other bits that I need to get done before New York then opens. Um, So, yeah, then I'll do the New York open at 2.30, but I'll get to my trading desk. I'll start working from 2 o'clock unless it's a news day and there's news out at 1.30. Oh, yes, of course. Okay, Um, and and what are your, you know, what is your approach? Um, You said you obviously, you know, um, trade the opens and and breakouts. Um, Mm. And tell us a bit about your SMC sort of strategy. Yeah, so the SMC, I suppose, relates to the technical analysis part. So the technical yeah. analysis part is largely based off the SMC concepts. But I do add a little bit of my own twist on it because there's also, I look at momentum as well, which is a big thing. Um, okay. It's a, it's a big part of the strategy for a lot of reasons. A, there's no. Po- I don't like to trade when it's just going up, when it's just chopping up and down, um, because you don't get as good risk to reward ratio, and you also don't get that instant feedback, which is nice <laughs> to get. <laughs> <laughs> Your psychology, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think yeah. you know when I was when I was a younger trader, I was holding weak trades for too long. And it would cause me to move my stop loss and mm-hmm. do all sorts of stupid things. And now I realize that actually if you trade that momentum, if you're going for those big moves, you know, when they're happening, then you do get that almost instant feedback. And it's quite clear if you are in a good trade or one that's worth holding. Um, if it's hanging around too long at entry or you know, going against you, then you don't have momentum. (laughs) So it doesn't, it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, So that's, so yeah, I use the SMC as the, as the technical analysis. We're tied in with a little bit of momentum as well, but I also, yeah, sorry, Caroline, just to interject there, can you just um, explain to our listeners the SMC uh, um, just for people who don't know what SMC stands Ah, for and break it down a bit for us, if you don't mind. No, that's fine. So SMC, so to my, to, based to my understanding, uh, stands for Smart Money Concepts. And I believe it was inspired by the teachings of ICT. I, I think that's the origin. He gets credited for SMC if it wasn't him. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and he was an institutional trader who's got a very popular YouTube channel. Um, and he teaches from that side of it i know that there's people who argue against it and say that it's not what he says it is but for whatever reason the patterns that he explains do show up so um i think that it's quite a helpful it is quite a helpful resource to sort of identify these certain patterns that show up he talks a lot about um stop hunting and he calls it liquidity grabbing so it's the idea that the institutional traders are moving the markets um to where they think that there's going to be a lot of stop losses to where Mm. they think that there's going to be a lot of easy money um i have spoken to other institutional traders who say 
that's not true. No one cares. <laughs> <laughs> but it keeps on happening, though. But you see the patterns. It yeah, you do it. see them. You do see them. So, uh-huh. you know, I think whether whether it's for that reason, it, it, even if it's not for that reason, but you apply a story that mm-hmm. makes sense to you, if yeah. it helps your trading, it works, you know? Yeah, exactly. I was about Sorry. to say, whether there's a conspiracy out or not, <laughs> if there's a pattern <laughs> worth looking at, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, but um, so yeah, that's the SMC. There's a lot of elements to it. So those liquidity grabs, um, those sp- pretty much it's a spike in the opposite direction. Um, so say if you've got a buy position, it would be a spike that hits your stop loss, a spike mm-hmm. down that hits your stop loss before then going up. So it's like you got the direction right, but you got stopped down. Yes. And I know a lot of new traders will probably. <laughs> But it's so frustrating. So frustrating, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he teaches how to overcome that. So how to wait for those to happen, to how to identify that that might happen and how to wait for it to happen before you enter. So those sorts of things is SMC style. Very cool. I think that's very helpful. Thank you, Caroline. You're welcome. Um, so what, like, you know, just based on what advice do you have for beginners then trying to manage their risk? Best advice that I could give a beginner (laughs) is keep your lot size tiny Mm. because you can still get the, there's nothing, there is nothing that's going to get you to learn how to trade other than trading and practicing, being involved, having real money on the line. So you can read as many books as you like, but you will learn the fastest by doing. Um, But you don't have to have big lot sizes. (laughs) You can keep it very, 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 very small. Um, that's the best thing, you know, if you're, if you're new, but also always have stop loss. Everyone knows that. Um, Mm. and also if there's too much volatility, like I was saying earlier, if the market's going up and down, there are some situations where you shouldn't actually be trading at all. And to be able to identify those as quickly as possible and to step out, um, is quite important. So if the market's going up and down, up and down in each candle, is got a higher pip value than your maximum stop loss, then it's almost impossible to get into a trade. So those are days, I call them untradables. <laughs> and yes. I say that those are the ones to sit out on. Yeah, that's very, very good advice, Caroline. Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we always talk about the, the the stop losses and obviously making sure that you don't move your stop loss yeah. you know, once you've <laughs> done your analysis. But yeah, I think probably more important, as you say, is having that that very small lot size when you're when you're starting out. It's helpful because you still get to trade, and that helps yeah. you to learn. Yeah. yeah, we were talking about this the other day, weren't we? The um, the importance of live trading versus a demo account, and how mm. how it actually might be beneficial to, as you say, trade with tiny, tiny, tiny lot sizes and actually risk some money, so you actually get the feeling of the um, of having a live trade out there, which you don't get with a demo account. Yeah, absolutely. Every there's I mean, it's famously everyone thinks that they're an excellent trader on demo. Uh-huh. <laughs> everyone gets rich on demo. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> and then yeah, when when it yeah, and you get the real thing, it's a very different very oh different. Oh my goodness, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, I closing trades too early is one of the biggest missed opportunities with the new traders as well and um missing opportunities is a big part of I guess something that I review in my own analysis. You know, I do what what have I done well? What can I do more of? What have I done badly? What can I do less of? And where are my missed opportunities? And I think for a lot of new traders, it's coming out of trades too early and taking too mm. small a wins when actually they could have got more out of it. Um, and that is to do with that fear that oh, I've made some money. I don't want it to go back against me now. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to lose the money I've made. <laughs> so, uh, but as you say, if you've got the smaller lot size, then you're sort of a little bit freer to, you know, go with that that trend or, you know, to let the trade run a bit longer. Um, yeah. To, to hit your, your profit target. I think this, do you know, I think the small lot size helps with people. Um, it helps in some ways. I think for there is a hindrance at some point you do have to you do have to increase it after a certain time so once you do get the feel for it um because i i also hear people talking about the boredom of using too small a lot size after too long 
Um, and then they're not taking it seriously. And then they're placing too many trades because they're oh, not taking yes. each one seriously enough. So there is there is obviously a downside to that. But yeah, I think when you first start, just keep those lot sizes small and then increase them at a manageable <laughs> pace. <laughs> uh, how would you how would you sort of suggest people do increase? You know, at what at what point? Sort of once they're consistently profitable or, you know, a certain percent. Um, um, I think sometimes usually what I do when I work with people there's we usually do a bit of a a rotation like a skill rotation so usually there'll be something really obvious that is a problem and that needs attention um so we work on that you know for a week or two weeks or you know practice a certain thing and then you can do a bit of a rotation so once you've actually then manage that area of it um say for example it's taking you know it's doing too big a lot size or you know you work on keeping your lot sizes small or if it's taking too big a stop loss work on keeping um keeping it tighter or if it's not holding trades you know make a game so that you're making points if you hold it for till the end um but once you've then worked on that skill you can then rotate and move on to something else so I guess it's part of a prioritizing as well. So where are, what's the biggest problem? For each person, it's going to be a different thing. You know, the mm-hmm. thing that they need to prioritize and need to work around. So usually you have to, what's it like having a bucket with holes in it? You just need to, <laughs> you need to, you need to fill those holes. If they're making, yeah. if they're making big losses, just let's sort those out quickly. And then you can move on to um, missed opportunities once you've and I guess. Those. I guess this is the the benefit of having a coach is that because you've also worked with so many people, you can really identify those patterns, you know, where they're going wrong. Yeah, I feel, yeah, I feel like it does come, that side of it comes quite naturally to me. I can see now where people are struggling. Usually they can tell me as well. So <laughs> um, people have a lot of insight uh, into their own trading, even though they don't necessarily know how to stop it. They know what they're doing wrong. Okay. So I get I get over trading all the time. That's one of the mm-hmm. biggest ones I get. <laughs> of course. Um, but yeah, you can, yeah, I would say that is a, a benefit to having a coach is that they can, it's someone the one that can help you work through all the issues some of them you're going to be aware of and some of them you're not even going to be aware of so sometimes you need to be pointed in the right direction and a lot of people just need a bit of accountability as well especially with over trading yeah no it is it's probably the biggest problem and it's something we i think we were talking about a couple episodes ago with um, the rise of uh, trading apps i mean it really drives people into over trading well it doesn't drive them into it but it allows it allows over trading especially for beginners um yeah. maybe don't have a desktop set up you know and they're just trading on their phone anyway they're sitting on their bus or whatever and oh, just goodness, end up, yeah. yeah exactly you know real <laughs> <laughs> rule number one don't trade on the bus <laughs> <laughs> yeah but indeed or um, in the pub <laughs> or in the pub or, yeah i mean i did say yeah it was one of when we record that alison i think a couple episodes ago you know and we were saying i think the end our conclusion was like really just try not to trade on your phone you know yeah <laughs> just just don't yeah. do it um, always trade at your desk <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. yeah it's okay for monitoring trades but um but yeah, yeah it's and people do tend to over trade so i mean about your um your as being a coach i mean what, do you find do you trade um I mean, do you trade do you coach beginners or more intermediate advanced traders i mean is there or is it a mix big mix i get people coming to me at all levels mm-hmm. so yeah i've had full-time traders who mm-hmm. only trade and they've maybe gone through a bit of a bad patch. I've had traders who are still having, you know, they've come to me even though they're doing well and they just want to learn a new skill or a new strategy. Uh, and I also get complete beginners. So, yeah, a big, a big mix there, which is nice. Yeah, I know I bet this. Yeah, you get something from everyone because, I mean, it's really rewarding. <laughs> it's really rewarding when people pick it up easy. So, if you know, there's a, a full-time trader they sometimes only need a couple sessions to get back on track um, because they know most of it already. Um, but then there's something really rewarding as well about, you know, someone coming to you not having known anything at all um, and then getting them the first win. It's really fun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I can imagine. 
It's mm. yeah, it's, it must be really rewarding. Do you do you yeah. have people come to you who you just like no, you're not suitable. Like I mean, you can't you can't trade, or do you do you think that's a myth? <laughs> um, do you know what? I don't think. I don't think I've had that yet, but that doesn't mean that I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I do pick up quite quick. Do you know what? I can actually tell. I've worked with so many people now that I can tell just from their email, that they, their initial email, whether mm-hmm. it's going to work out or not. Mm-hmm. So I think it never really progresses past that. You can usually, when it's going to work out, they have a lot of in-depth questions and I can just tell that they're in the right headspace for it. Right, of course. Um, and I think it doesn't really, t- it doesn't tend to progress to the point where we actually have a meeting and get it all set up if they aren't, you know, if it's everything's very vague. Mm-hmm. Um, so I th- maybe, maybe I just automatically <laughs> weed people out through that process. But I find that virtually everyone that's come to me has been very intelligent, even if they don't credit themselves for it. I I can see it. I feel like they're intelligent. And um, yeah, and I like I like them all. <laughs> they're all good <laughs> people. That's great. <laughs> That's really important. And yeah, is there is there a particular okay. methodology you have for for coaching? Um, I suppose it depends what uh, stage people come to me at, but I have a lot of cheat sheets and checklists and mm-hmm. I have so many printables because I think it's yeah I mean my my whole philosophy is to try and save people as much time try to make things as easy to understand as possible um and take out all of the guesswork so the whole reason why people come to a coach and ask for a coach's help is because they want someone to do the work for them they want to be put in you know the they don't want to guess they want someone to structure things so I do I have a lot of cheat sheets checklists principles things to help them guides all of that so it really depends what stage people are at as to you know where we where we start with but I don't know if uh, I don't know if that answers the methodology question but oh, it does I think I think I it's do. really yeah I mean <laughs> no of course I don't think I don't think a professional trainer is going to need a cheat sheet or maybe they do. I don't know. But, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone loves a cheat sheet. <laughs> Everyone loves a cheat sheet. But I can imagine for beginners coming in, especially, you know, that's really useful. It really gives them a, it's, yeah, like a, a confidence boost to have checklists and, and cheat sheets. And, and um, yeah. I saw in your, in one of your videos where you talked about your trading journey, you were talking about that you've got your um, sheets up on the wall um, with uh, the opening times of the markets. And that, uh, you know, and that that kind of thing, I think, must be really beneficial for, for beginners. Oh, my key times of day cheat sheet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone loves that one. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes, yeah, do you know what? I think one of the biggest things is sometimes people come into it and there's so much to learn. And even though it's really obvious once you say it, sometimes you just need someone to say it and put it in a really obvious structured format for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean, when, when you look at that, it's, it's really obvious, you know, everyone knows London opens at eight in the UK, but sometimes just having it on paper and to be like, this is, this is a key time of day. <laughs> this mm-hmm. is when you want to be looking for a trade. <laughs> yeah, no, it is good. And I mean, uh, and do you find that, I mean, you, know, you said that you also coach you know, professional traders and more experienced traders. Do mm. you find that there's ingrained mistakes that that professional traders and and uh and more experienced traders make and are they the same kind of mistakes that you see over and over again well i guess what i'm asking mm-hmm. is there is there something that you know for more experienced traders listening to this you know is it something that they that you see a lot uh you see quite often coming up that you think uh, that you have to coach out of them well not necessarily yeah. coach out of them but, but help them with. <laughs> i think that one thing i see quite a lot is um getting really obsessive about technicals <laughs> right um, and yeah that I do see that quite a lot so getting really um hung up on certain patterns and certain technical as- aspects so thinking that the market has to come that back to this point or it has to go this has to be my entry this is the exact point and actually sometimes you have to you know just just go with what the market gives you you know 
sometimes you get a textbook set up and sometimes it's a little bit weird (laughs) 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 and you just kind of have to go with it you never know which one you're going to get and you have to be nimble sometimes sometimes Mm -hmm. it's like a break break and retrace um is it break and retest sometimes you get the retest and sometimes you don't but if you're hung up on only entering on the retest you'll miss a big break a big momentum move yeah Really interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, we do see this and I think it's something um, we've talked about as well, Alison, as uh, as you say, like people, and I think probably not just um, more experienced traders, I think beginners as well, when they're learning technical analysis and they're getting really into it, mm. you see some of the charts they come up with just absolutely <laughs> smothered in in indicators. And you're like, how can you see what's going on behind all this? <laughs> yeah. New traders love technical indicators, don't yeah, they? Yeah. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and uh, what would I mean? I, I mean, this might be a tricky question, um, but maybe I'm going to put you on the spot here. But what's the mm-hmm. single most important piece of advice you would give to um, you would give to a trader who'd come to you? The single most important bit of advice. Mm. Mm, I'm tempted to say, uh, understand fundamentals. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's because that was the biggest pivot in my personal journey. And also, I suppose when I teach other people and they pick that up after being obsessed with technicals, they kind of realize how it all ties in and how you do need to know both. Um, Also, I think it's really important for each day. It helps you to, to manage the day because you obviously get news releases at different times. And if you look at that day on its individual merits, then you can kind of figure out where you might where you might get moves and also when you might not want to trade. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'd say I just being, being really aware of that <laughs> is helpful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's a fantastic advice. And then, I mean, you've, you've mentioned, I think, that you're also you're starting to become a, a financial advisor in the UK. Um, yeah. Um, what, why, I mean, what, what brought that about? Um, <laughs> It's it it's ridiculous. <laughs> the very first reason that I decided to do it was because I had to put a disclaimer up on my YouTube channel saying I am not a financial mm-hmm. advisor. And I yep. thought, I don't I don't want to have that up anymore. I want to I want to have an official qualification. I don't want to disclaim people before they've even watched my video. Um so that started that kick started um the idea that maybe I should have an official qualification. Um there was, you know, again, it's people, there's so many um, unqualified people in this industry. Mm-hmm. And I wanted, I suppose, you know, I've built a business, <laughs> a whole business around trading. And I wanted to have, um, yeah, I guess an official qualification. I wanted to, I didn't want to have that disclaimer up. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot but, of work to get rid of a bit of, a bit of text. <laughs> yeah, oh my goodness, the exams are so intense. They are so intense. So yeah, it's a lot of work. I realize um, I do I do think it's ridiculous now. Every time I get through a sec- uh, like another assignment, I'm, I wonder why I'm doing this. But actually, another reason is a lot of the people, when I coach them, they come to me and I get asked, I get asked every question. I get asked questions about, you know, not only do they ask questions about trading, but I they're they're wanting divorce advice, they're wanting mortgage advice, they're oh, wow. wanting inheritance <laughs> tax advice. So everyone comes to me for everything. And I think, do you know what? It'd be really cool if I could actually help you on this <laughs> rather than telling you I can't. Yeah, and I guess that I guess that brings you to my next question. I mean, where where are you gonna go with this? Because I mean, as you say, you can offer advice on all kinds of aspects yeah. of of wealth now uh, going forward um yeah. is that something that interests you moving into the moving a, maybe away from trading and into into becoming a financial advisor well i'm going to i whether this is ridiculous or not i'm going to try and manage both of them because i feel emotionally attached to trading angel <laughs> right it's my baby company that i grew and I feel I feel very proud of it. I feel very happy with it. And I love I love coaching. Uh, I love trading. But do you know what? I kind of I want to add to it. I want to build on it. I want to also be able to help other people in other areas as well. So, Trading Angel is going to get a sister company. Oh, fantastic! And uh, yeah, so when it's all when I have my final 
when I pass my final exam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Feels like they never end, but when it happens, I will launch a sister company for Trading Angel and I'll try and run the both of them. But I might need some help. I might need to hire some people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might. Well, very yeah. good luck, Caroline. I mean, that's <laughs> that's you. fantastic news. Yeah, yeah, good for you. That's such, a, that's such an inspiring story, Caroline, really. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, but but on that note, you know, um, we mentioned last week, uh, a couple of, actually it was at the beginning of the year. Um, I think it was the first, po first podcast of the year, yeah. Yes, it was, um, about women in trading and the, and the mm -hmm. gender gap. Um, yeah. And we spoke about how differently men and women approach trading, that women are naturally more cautious and sort of risk averse. Um, mm. And obviously, you know, the 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 big guys in trading are are very rarely women, un unfortunately. Um, mm. uh, but what what we found is, even though they make less money, they actually they lose less money um, mm. according to statistics. So that's very interesting. Um, so it's just exciting from that point of view that you are, you know, really diving headfirst into into this world, um, just because. Um, you know, women, I, I think we actually, we said before that women only make up about 14% yeah. of, um, of uh, people who work in the finance sector. So, so it's yeah. fantastic to hear that you, you know, you're really taking the bull by the horns here um, uh, and, and covering all bases. It's, it's very inspiring. Um, yeah. But having said that, like, what was your experience as a woman in, in trading? I mean, have, have you felt it's, you know, have you have you felt in, uh, that it might be different for you as women than it it might be for for say uh, you know other people that you know in trading that are that are men? To be completely honest, whilst I know the statistics say that there is this big gap between the genders, and I know that yeah. is obviously a true fact. Um, my honest feeling. I am a very glass half full type person, but my honest feeling is that I, I haven't felt disadvantaged. Perhaps I'm lucky that everyone's being more aware of that gender pay gap these days. And perhaps it's a time, you know, now is a good time to be a woman in finance mm -hmm. um, because it's more aware of it. The other thing is also I, I built a company and obviously I'm going to hire myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I didn't discriminate me for being a woman. Um, I've never tried to get a job with anyone else as a female in finance, so who knows? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, I am that's aware true. that a lot of women that I've spoken to as traders have different um, stories to me, and they've they've got different experiences. So I wouldn't want to belittle anyone else's experience with it because I know a lot of women do feel like they have had a massive disadvantage or they've been in situations that they feel very uncomfortable with um but I guess from my own experience because it's my company and I haven't really you know I I can pay myself whatever I like so <laughs> but I, I also you know I think it's very important what you mentioned earlier you know just now is that um I think the younger generations don't experience as much, um, you know, that they, they they sort of have an easier in, um, yeah. in into the finance world than than maybe generate you know previous generations. Um, so that's yeah. the point that you raise. But it's also it's just it's great that you haven't experienced that. It means that maybe there is some change that's happening. You know, um, I mean, it's possible. I have been disadvantaged. I've just been blissfully unaware of it. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. Um, <laughs> Well, then I wouldn't say you're a glass half. Did you say a glass half empty or glass half full? I'm I'm glass half full. I've always been oh. I've always been a yeah eternal yeah. optimist. Said, yes, of course. Sorry, I, I, for some reason I thought you said empty, and I was like, no, I might I have done. <laughs> <laughs> I might have said that by accident, but I meant full. <laughs> yeah, no, you definitely are. You're 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 a very positive, um, positive, um, you know, presence. Thank you. <laughs> um, and do you, but but on that, do you do you find? I mean, you you coach men and women. Do you yeah. find that men and women traders sort of trade differently? Have you noticed a difference? Or honestly, honestly, I as again, I know the statistics say um, a certain thing. So it's possible that the people who've come to me, it's possible that the people who approach me for coaching are a certain type of people. So it's not. Um, a fair representation of like a full cross section of traders but I would say okay. that I haven't noticed 
a gender difference. I there is a lot there are a lot of men who are, have incredible attention to detail and are so precise and careful, um, which I, I guess you would stereotypically assume was a female trait. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then there are women who are completely reckless, but also, <laughs> but also the other way around as well. There are women who have great attention to detail, who ask, you know, incre- you know, I see both. I see both on both sides. So okay. I haven't noticed a difference. But also, it, as I say, it could be that the people who go for coaching are a certain type of person anyway. So I would say someone who's looking for coaching is probably someone who likes efficiency. Um, who likes to do things in a certain way, um, who likes to seek out help. So, yeah, it might not be a fair cross-section. Okay. Yeah, that's a good answer. That's a very, very – because I, th- I think we also are bombarded with this whole thing between men and women. And, mm. you know, and it, um, it's also nice to see that other side that you, you, you don't notice that yourself. So that's, that's, yeah. that's also a good perspective. Um, we spoke earlier that um, you said that you have just hired a your first um, yeah. employee. Yeah, yeah, that felt like a big moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic! I was so excited. <laughs> that's wonderful. It's um, a trading trading angel coachee. Is that the right word? So, someone who's been through the trading angel coaching program, who I've coached, has recently. Um, you know, he was looking to leave his full-time job and wanted to trade full-time. And then it, and then it happened. And he's been, he's been getting prop firm payouts and he's been getting regular prop firm payouts and big ones as well. And I'm so inspired and so over the moon by how well he's doing that I decided to hire him as the trading angel prop firm coach so he can help other people make that same transition, transformation. Congratulations. That's absolutely amazing. Thank you. And congratulations yeah. to them as well. Yeah. Yeah. And nothing makes me happier than when someone reaches their goals. It's so, it's the best feeling in the world. And um, mm. yeah, it's so nice to see, you know, especially when someone's been feeling worn down by their nine to five and been mm-hmm. wanting it and working hard for so long. Um, so yeah, it's a very exciting moment. Mm. Oh, that's fantastic. That's really good. Um, well, Caroline, and is, is there anything else you wanted to ask Alison? Oh, sorry. <laughs> but, <laughs> Caroline won't ask me anything. <laughs> I thought I won't, got loads to ask you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I, th- I think we, m- we, might, um, we might ask your employee for an interview as well and, and uh, to hear their story. Um, yeah. Oh, so, I'm sure he would love to. Yeah, that would be fantastic. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think we've covered everything we we sort of um, you know that I had sort of running through my mind. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Is, there, is there anything from your side, Chris? No, I don't think so. I mean, it's been. I just wanted to say, as Alison said, it's been really just inspiring listening to you talk, Caroline. Um, and I think a lot of traders. And what I love about your story is is that it starts with this chaos, as you said at the <laughs> beginning, you know, in this naivety, and it's grown into this um, wonderful story where it's changed completely altered your life um and now you're helping other people with alter their lives um uh, which is in it's a wonderful story and as we were talking like i mean earlier about all these scams there's so many bad stories in trading and so it's really nice to hear hear such a wonderful story Um, oh thank you so thank you so much thank you for uh, having me for coming on i wish you all the success you know in the future with your um is it a diploma hey yeah it's uh, yeah diploma. it's it's called a dipfer a dip uh, so i get to put that after my name <laughs> 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 which isn't very catchy it isn't I'm Caroline Mundell <laughs> dipfer <laughs> trading angel <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah very cool. but it's yeah it's been absolutely wonderful chatting to you and yeah again i just i just feel so inspired it's it's been a wonderful wonderful talk thank you karima oh thank you so much for having me it's been great to talk to you guys and to meet you yeah thank you so much I, well caroline hope, um yeah go on Alison. Yes. no i was saying I, I hope we keep in touch Yes, absolutely. I was going to say, yeah, we'll we will do this again. Yeah, we should have you on um, and see see how you're getting on. When do you when do you um, when are you planning to to get your diploma? 
<laughs> I'm hoping to pass. <laughs> <laughs> I, I plan to pass at the end of May. <laughs> end of May. End of May. Okay. So I don't, it's not too long away now. It isn't. That's very close. No, we'll definitely, let's get you back on uh, after that. And oh, I would see. love that. I would love yeah, that. Yeah, we can hear about the next stage in your adventures. Yes, sounds good. I would love that. Super. Mm. Well, Caroline, thank you so much again um, for coming on. Thank you. All right. Have a lovely evening. You too. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.